so. Can I ask a question real quick? Uh, this am I in the right room? This is Andrew Austin. Is this uh. Yeah, I think you are. You're, okay. You're for yeah. Um, yeah. Technology. Yep. <clears throat> okay. Just just checking. I have a, I. I'll go ahead. I'm sorry. I know. So well, hopefully you're in the right spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't done one of these. Uh, I've done Zoom meetings, but I haven't done a Zoom conference. So it's like. Hey, it's me, Andrew Austin of the Far Podcast, the podcast associated with the Freedom and Reason blog. You can read my blog at andrewaustin.blog. There you'll find over 450 essays on race, class, religion, culture, and a myriad of other topics. Scoot on over there, check it out, subscribe, like if you want, comment if you want. I'd appreciate all of that. Today I'm going to share with you my presentation at the 46th Annual Mid-South Sociological Association Conference. This was held October 14th through 17th, 2020. It's in fact still going on. I'm recording this uh, Saturday at, uh, early afternoon. I'll tell you the title of the paper in the content of this podcast. I just wanted to share this with you because I think it's a pressing issue. Uh, we're making some progress in criminal justice reform in the United States, but we could do so much more. Uh, the Norwegians provide a model that I believe if we, what well, we would have to adapt it to our circumstances, but that if we do so, um, that we can do a much better job of um, rehabilitation, returning uh returning our fellow citizens uh, back to mainstream society where they can lead meaningful and productive lives at the same time that we enhance public safety. Um, and Norway has a, has a brilliant humanitarian way of doing this. And I go through some of the details, but I also provide uh, some information about the patterns of, of imprisonment, uh, mass incarceration in the United States, which is, on the decline, which is good news. Uh, and then the, um, the prison populations, uh, both in Norway and in Sweden, which I use as a, as a nearby comparison. So I hope you enjoy this talk. Uh, as always, I look forward to your, uh, comments and questions. Uh, just let me know. Uh, you can subscribe to this podcast. I'd appreciate it very much. And again, um, Please visit my blog and read my essays and tell me what you think. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, so um, so this is contemporary penology, thinking about transformation of systems and persons. And I'm Andrew Austin. I'm at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. I'm associate professor there. I teach uh, mostly on matters of uh, law and society, but as I just was explaining, I have political e economy background. I'm going to talk about rehabilitation in the Norwegian correctional system. Um, and the paper I'm going to discuss uh, is a series. I'm on sabbatical right now, and I'm writing a series of papers having to do uh, comparative research into the Norwegian, Swedish, uh, and the Nordic model generally and compare that to the United States, uh, the situation that we face here. So I'm interested in U.S. style penology in light of the innovative approaches of the Nordic model. So what, what can we learn uh, from what they do? And I'm going to wrap this in uh, theory on prisonization, uh, Gresham Sykes, pains of imprisonment. Um, and I'm going to focus mainly on Norway, but I'm going to use Sweden as a near comparison as well. And so mainly between the U.S. and, and Norway. I have to, uh, 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 Doreen was, uh, worked with me on this, uh, is working with me on this project. She did her sabbatical, 
uh, in 2000, I guess it was 17, uh, 18, uh, in, in Sweden. Uh, and I've, I've been to Sweden several times. And so I, I helped work to help her with that sabbatical. And she was looking at Mark Colvin's ideas of social support and she's a social worker. And, uh, and then when I, I traveled my exploratory piece, I was there in 2018 and I traveled, uh, through Norway and Sweden with her. She can't be here today. Um, and she was going to talk on the social work component. Uh, in the Norwegian and Swedish systems. She primarily focused on Sweden. Uh, we've arranged, and she really spearheaded this, an exchange, research exchange, between the University of Gothenburg and the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay. And Wisconsin is one of the states that's moving fairly aggressively forward with uh, with uh, penal reform. Um, and that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, in, well, not since COVID, but before COVID, there were a lot of employment pressures. So the idea was, how can we work, you know, jobs programs in with rehabilitation and get more people out into the workforce? Uh, North Dakota has been doing this, Alaska, uh, Hawaii, and they've been using Norway's model. So uh, the next the next step, uh, I, I, well, I'm, I'm going to publish several papers on this, um, but the next step is sort of to send a delegation from Wisconsin to uh, Norway uh, and talk to them, uh, and, and hopefully we can borrow these ideas. Um, the penal system in the U.S. has been very stubborn to outside ideas, uh, and so it's it's promising that we're in a period where people are beginning to beginning to think about this uh, this problem. Uh, so let me I've already told you some uh, about this, and I'm trying to take too much time. Um, but, but I do want to lay out a little bit of the theory here, and, and then I want to talk about the, some statistics on this, the profile that we see in the prison systems in Norway and Sweden and the United States. And then I want to talk about how the theory applies to understanding the benefits of Norway's rehabilitative model, uh, because it really is fascinating. So I traveled there, as I said, in the summer of 2018, and I went – uh, initially to, to Gothenburg uh, to speak. I was going to speak with law enforcement there because uh, this is on the west coast of Sweden. And they've had uh, – Sweden has been experiencing quite a rapid increase in crime, which is unusual for Sweden. Uh, and I was trying to – I wanted to learn about, you know, and the, there's a whole situation with the policing in the United States. I was initially curious in – uh, with the a, with a rapidly changing demographics in Sweden, how the police were dealing with those with that those realities. And uh, but when I got there, th things just opened up broadly for me. I, I I was invited to come to Stockholm. I met with uh, the prison officials there in Lilleholmen, which is a district in the Stockholm archipelago. Um, and then I was invited to come to um, uh, Lilleholmen is the district in Stockholm. Lillestrøm, so we don't get confused. But Lillestrøm, uh, which is right outside of Oslo. Uh, there at the University of uh, College of Norwegian Correctional Service, uh, and I got tours of facilities, and we really dug into to research, and it was very exciting. So, um, I was offered a, 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 a semester during my sabbatical to be at the University of Gothenburg, and that's where I would be right now if it wasn't for COVID nineteen, because they. They shut down travel. So my research has been greatly constrained. I'm working through it. I can make it happen it, it, uh, uh, you know, remotely. Um, but that was, a, that was a big disappointment. Anyway, that was with the, the, the Department of Sociology and Work Science, which is fascinating if you think about the combination of those concepts. So they don't have a standalone sociology program. The University of Gothenburg is massive. That's the second largest city in, in Sweden. Uh, and they've got they've got an even larger social work program. So Doreen was involved was involved there. So it's exciting. In any case, uh, so um, what 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 what's the theory that moves me here? Uh, so in 1940, Don Klimmer published the Prison Community, in which he coined the term prisonization, and he defines it uh, as the taking on by inmates of folkways, mores, customs, and general culture of penitentiary. Right. So that's it's rooted in that that great sociological tradition. And he said that this plays a fundamental role in determining the success of rehabilitation. Prisoners acquire habits when they're uh, in prison, and this is true for institutional life generally. I'll talk a little bit about Goffman here. And what happens is that these habits replace the inmates' prior sensibilities, right, to the detriment of, of reformation, of character. Now, there's 
various co competing theories, you know, does, does prisonization emerge from, you know, the structure of prisons or is it imported from outside, like some of the gang culture and so forth? So, and I only say that because I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about importation and import, and I don't want that to be confused with that argument because the way that Norwegians think about the, the, the question of Im import uh, is, is quite different, qualitatively different. Uh, Stanton Wheeler in 1961, his article Socialization and Correctional Communities, argues that there's an internalization of the criminal outlook in prison. So a person gets there for various reasons, then they are submerged in a culture. Uh, and, but it's not just about being around other criminals. Uh, there's these austere realities of incarceration. This happens with concentration camps, with, with military service, uh, psychiatric facilities documented by, by, by Goffman most powerfully. Uh, and Goffman describes these as total institutions. So that's a concept that, um, that I use in my, my thinking about this. Uh, and that's where life unfolds according to externally imposed, very inflexible rules. All right, but we have to we have to hedge a bit on that for reasons that uh, Gresham Sykes points out. So Sykes in 1958 wrote a book, and if you, it's one of those books that you sort of you just have to read. Uh, Gresham Sykes, uh, and I hope he's always remembered in sociology. He and David Matza developed the techniques of neutralization. It was a very famous article around that time. Very powerful stuff. Um, he, in Society of, of, of Captives, he talks about the pains of imprisonment. Now, I'm going to go through those in a minute. I want to see if I can do a uh, show screen here uh, in a minute uh, and talk about those pains because they're very important in dis distinguishing the U.S. system from the Norwegian system. I mean, this is the, the critical piece, and I haven't seen this in the literature yet. Um so there's five deprivations, and I'll get to those in a minute. But but it's very fascinating in in the society of captives, where he, he talks about power. It, it it's not it's not naked power in a penitentiary, and and you know in the sense that the guards just sort of lord over prisoners. It's it's wrapped in legitimacy, and this is a big part of what Sykes argues. In techniques of neutralization, he said the reason that criminals make up excuses is they must already assume that what they're doing is wrong, right? And so they have to, they, they understand that what they, they do is wrong. Therefore, they have to rationalize it uh, to themselves and to other people and probably more to other people. And so in a real world relationship, you have what Max Weber, you know, defines as authority, that is legitimate power. And so penitentiaries run on the question of legitimacy. And, but because they're total institutions, Gresham argues, there's these what he calls defects of total power. And any, any system in which you're totally controlled uh, is, is, is corruptible or, you know, it's sort of corrupt fundamentally. It corrupts the guards. It corrupts the prisoners. And so you have this twin dynamic of this inner moral compulsion to obey, you know, those who are being controlled. I mean, you know, th those who are under control have this moral compulsion to obey. Uh, and then you also have the legitimate effort or right to exercise control, which is recognized by the prisoner. And I say that because, you know, co control over the coercive machinery of the penitentiary isn't enough to control prisoners. Since you depend on their compliance, you actually can use that. You can leverage that to facilitate the rehabilitative process. And this is something that the Norwegian penologists have understood that it's been difficult to get penologists in the United States to understand, right? And so they set up control systems and it's all about surveillance and regimes. You know, uh, for example, in Norway, they have kitchens and the prisoners can use knives. And that sounds shocking when you talk to a U.S. correctional uh, official. Uh, we, you never let prisoners anywhere near knives. Uh, but the idea is that there's a trust factor there. Right, and this is this is part of, a, and I'll get into this, but a much uh, more comprehensive open system that Norway pursues, because the idea is that you want life in prisons to be as much like life outside of prisons. If you want to avoid prisonization, it just follows. So the community, you have a community, as Klimmer pointed out, the prison community, but it's built upon these power asymmetries, and so you have the potential for degradation. That does occur. You have the potential for abuse, but you also have the potential for cooperation because it is a community. And so the question is how much more – how can we emphasize the community part over the sort of total total power part? 
So, so, so the pains of imprisonment, there's five. There's deprivation of autonomy, which uh, is, you know, results from uh, the administered life of total institution, deprivation of goods and services. Um, and this is, you know, the idea, the ideology, well, if you think about it, uh, what it is, why we send people to prison, and this is a the the the, the deterrence piece is a big part uh, of the discussion here. the The idea that prisons should be uncomfortable places, right? And so, if you think that for deterrence they should be uncomfortable places, you've got a real contradiction then with sort of rehabilitation, right? Uh, and so, when people see like when you do a tour of a Norwegian prison, the first thing that strikes you is they have dorms. They have apartments. They have uh, they have privacy. In other words, when they go to the bathroom, they don't go to the bathroom out in the open like they do in U.S. prisons. They have a desk. They have a computer. They have access to the internet. They have a library. They have their own separate shower. Uh, and so you're thinking, well, this is pretty comfortable. Uh, so where's the deterrent effect? So part of the deprivation of goods and services comes from this this over reliance. I'll argue. It's an over reliance uh, on deterrence theory. Not that there isn't a deterrent effect. Nobody wants even Norwegian prisoners will tell you they don't want to be there. I mean, it may be comfortable, but uh, there's better. There's places that are better to be. We have an ideology of uh, of individual responsibility in the United States, which is a big piece of this. Uh, so uh, Sweden and Norway, as you might imagine, they're social democracies. There's much more a sense of collective and, and you know and uh, Sort of social responsibility. That's a big part of uh, of of the culture there. Uh, in fact, they would argue that in some ways they're sort of humanitarian to a fault. In other words, maybe they could be tougher. I heard this from Swedish penologists. We could be tougher, but just like it's hard to convince Americans to be softer, to be more efficacious in their policy, it's hard to convince Swedes to be harsher. <laughs> even if you could show that there was uh, efficacy in doing so. Um, as you have the symbolic taint of crime, prisoners are unworthy of ordinary levels of dignity. This is another concept. People, this is the, the retributive piece of it, right? We have to be, we have to meet out uh, retribution, just deserts. The deprivation of heterosexual relations. Um, I, I can just say very quickly that both in the Nor Norwegian and Swedish system, they allow conjugal visits. Uh, and uh, the argument being that this is an important part of keeping the person on the inside connected with the society on the outside. Uh, there's four states in the United, only four states in the United States that allow conjugal visits, and they're, they're highly restrictive. Uh, the deprivation of liberty, uh, and this is really the the key piece. In, in Norway, what they'll tell you is the only thing they really deprive. It's not exactly true, but they they are aware that they deprive people of liberty. Uh, and so, uh, but they try to keep, they, they, they avoid the cells, you know, as I said, it's more of, they have these pods in their dormitories, people living in collectively in pods, working and cooking together. Um, they, they try, they try to avoid the checkpoints. They don't make people march in formation. They have surveillance, but they try to, uh, to, to, to let prisoners know what the surveillance is for. Uh, and the the reason why they want to tamp down on this is they, they want to avoid isolation they want to avoid degradation these are you know two very important elements they also don't want to weaken the social bonds to family and friends so, so they realize they have to have more connection to the outside I don't it's very difficult to visit somebody in an American prison and now they're moving to virtual systems and you actually then have to pay money to a private company in order to be able to have a meeting virtually uh, with your loved one. And so it's, uh, you know, it, it, we, we all talk about how alienating virtual technology is when you're isolated in degrading conditions and the only connection you have to the outside is virtually very limited uh, and, and monitored, um, it becomes difficult. Then deprivation of security. So prisons are violent and otherwise unsafe, uh, unsafe places. So let me, let me just move. I, 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 time's going to get away from me if I don't uh, pick up the pace. But um, so presently the United States incarcerates, and I'm sure that, I'm sure you're aware of this. We incarcerate more people than, than any other country on the planet. Uh, you know, the statistics that are commonly uh, 
you know, cited is uh, of the world's 8 million prisoners, we have a quarter of them. Uh, and of course, we are the third largest country, uh, but the two, the two countries that are larger than, than the United States don't have nearly as many prisoners. So it is a, an extraordinary situation. It is going down, as you can see, uh, both uh, the number of prisoners and the rate. Uh, but what I want to, um, the, the main thing that I want to say here is that uh, is about prison overcrowding, we continue to run you know, uh, you know, 125%, 150% capacity, you know, so we have, we have prison overcrowding is a real problem here in Wisconsin, here in Green Bay. Um, the, 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 the penitentiary is dreadfully overcrowded. It's very old. A lot of these are very old structures. Uh, and, uh, they're actually difficult to, to, to be a, be effect, do effective surveillance. So if you're thinking about security issues, a lot of these prisons are structurally unsafe, architecturally unsafe. Uh, and so there's a real, it's, it, it's great that the prison population is going down. Why is that? Well, we're in, we, except for the last year or so, we've been in the midst of a historic decline in crime, primarily violent crime. And violent crime really drives the prison population. Um, in fact, violent crime last year was in the, in, the, in the last few years has been lower than it's been in 40, 50 years. It's, it's quite remarkable. The other thing is we're starting to embark on criminal justice reform, as I said, but I don't think we're going to see the effects of that until a few years out. Uh, so that's promising. Um, so uh, what about our record of rehabilitation? Uh, there's a statistic, more recent statistics show better numbers, but th those are tentative there's a long-term study that really starts at 2005 and then looks at uh, recidivism, going out, reoffending, going out. And what we find is that in that study, 68% of those released in prison in 2005 within three years were rearrested. Re uh, eight years down the road, we're looking at some, something like 83%. At nine years, 83% are rearrested. Now, there's also revocation, right, of parole. So you get out, there's technical violations. And this is something, this is a big area of reform. We could do a lot in lowering the recidivism rate by getting rid of these arbitrary technical violations that send people back. Uh, to be reincarcerated, this is my view, but to be reincarcerated should require a separate crime and conviction that would be worthy of being reincarcerated. So, by comparison, then if you look at you look at Norway uh, in 2020, they had 2,653 prisoners in 34 correctional facilities, and you say, well, uh, they're a much smaller country. That's true, but um, the uh, let me just give you the statistic. If you look at the rate of incarceration, and I should bring up, this is Norway. If you look at the rate of incarceration in the United States, is 639 per 100,000. That depends on how you're measuring it, but that's, that's, that's a good ballpark number. It's 49 per 100,000. So it's, it's astronomically lower in Norway, uh, the rate of incarceration. Uh, the evidence that the, Nor that the Norwegian government presents, and, and I spoke with their officials there, and it's a solid number, their, their recidivism rate is about 20%, and substantially lower than the United States. Uh, and the reason, uh, the, the, the interesting thing is they've actually been on a get tough crime kick for a number of years, as you can see. They've started to see the, their, their imprisonment rates going down, that's in part uh, the effect of, of locking more people up, and I'll get into this more, but it's a massive shift in who they're locking up, right? They've, they've switched their focus to violent offenders, and they had a real problem with overcrowding. In fact, they have this system in Norway called the Q, where you'd be convicted of a crime, you'd have to sit at home and wait for a cell to open up. And some people would sit at home for two or three years, waiting to... that. You're thinking, well, they're going to commit crime in the meantime if they're not in prison and they're violent offenders. And so what they did was they switched to take nonviolent offenders, put them in the queue, and focus on violent offenders. At the same time, they embarked on this very aggressive model in which they're going to reduce those pains of imprisonment. They're very aware of Sykes' argument, and they, they use it to mediate uh, their rehabilitation uh, their prison programs. So what you have now is, and this is 
incredible news. You have the prison population going down. At the same time, they run at three-quarters capacity. So they've eliminated the queue. So now anybody who's convicted doesn't sit and wait for a prison. They immediately go into the system. And the importance of that is not to incarcerate a person, but to get them into the rehabilitation regime so that they can get treatment. Um, and there's all kinds of details of this that are fascinating. I mean, essentially every prisoner, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between prisoner and correctional official. So essentially every prisoner gets a life coach. And every rehabilitation program is tailored to that person because they use person-centered approaches. And the research is all within subject. So they don't do cross-sexual analysis. And you can do that uh, to a large extent in Sweden because of social democracy, they've got cradle-to-grave record keeping for everybody. So you have a universal health care system, uh, et cetera. They do have a lot of uh, recent uh, arrivals. Uh, and it, one of the failings they admit is that 29% of the prisoners in the Norwegian system are foreign born. Uh, there was a migration crisis that occurred. Uh, you may have heard about uh, in 2014, 2015 in Europe. And uh, the Scandinavian state, Sweden in particular, took qu quite a large number of them. Now, if you compare that to Sweden, uh, and I have a chart here just to show you that Sweden saw their prison population going down while Norway's was going up, and, 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 and this is what I was reporting for a number of years until recent years, you've seen this reversed. So you see now Norway's population is going down, Sweden's going up. Sweden has now moved to aggressively control crime the way Norway did years before. And this has a lot to do with politics. Norway had a right-wing tending government in uh, 2006. So they switched politically towards the right. At the same time, the penologists there continued pushing a progressive agenda with rehabilitation. And that has to do with the structure of, of Scandinavian government, right? You can have a right-wingers in politics who are running sort of macro policy and law, but you have the the penologists, they continue to maintain, and the social workers, et cetera, they maintain institutional autonomy. So they can consider to, can continue to develop and administer policy. And so it, Norway's been very successful in that way. Um, and so what, what looked like was very harsh punishment coming out of a right-wing government was leveraged in a way to actually sharply reduce crime in Norway while reducing their prison population or preparing to reduce the prison population over the long term uh, and then also reduce overcrowding, which allows you to give more attention to each one of the prisoners, right? Uh, so theirs is going down for a policy reason. This is the point I want to make. The United States is, is we you could say if we started our criminal justice reform eight, ten years ago, that it was going down for that reason. But we can't say that. In fact, it's something of a mystery as to why crime rates have been declining all over the all over the Western world. We're not exactly sure because some countries have incarcerated, some countries haven't. So, you know, if you say prisons did it, you can't consistently show that. Uh, so there's 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 a lot of a lot of speculation as to why that's happening. I mean, we all have our, our, our theories, but um, so Sweden is running at about 101% capacity. They're expecting uh, as this rise, they're going to go over capacity soon. Uh, there's a little bit of a rivalry between Norway and, and, uh, and Swedes uh, uh, in correctional uh, policy. If you have conversations, they like to believe they have the better system, although I think everybody's beginning to admit that Norway has the better system at this point, and this is why people are, are looking into that. Um, so, uh, so I've explained that. So there, let me just then real quickly. Uh, so the idea in the Norwegian system is what's called reintegration. You, in, in the U.S., you may be aware that if you're in prison for five, you know, six years, you're going to get out in the last six, three to six months, you start pre preparing for reentry. And Norwegians are like, that's crazy. You should prepare for reentry on day one. As soon as you go into the system, we're going to prepare you for reentry because you're getting out. The other nice thing is I think the average sentence in Norway is about eight months to be in prison. And to, it's very rare for people to be in prison longer than three years. And the maximum penalties for the worst crimes between 14, 17 years. They do have a system of you know preventative incapacitation where they can hold a person for, say, if a person's, you know, if there's a psychiatric issue. 
The same way it works here, you can you can hold a person, you know, indefinitely in some sense, right? And because you can't let them out unless you declare they're 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 better. Um, but that's very rare uh, in the system. So most people, the va everybody's getting out. Let me put it that way. Everybody's getting out. The Norwegians say, why would you do anything while they're in prison to increase the likelihood they're coming back in? Because the reason that prison population's going down. The reducing the prison population is because the recidivism rate so low. So you want to have fewer people coming in, but the most important thing is people who come in and get out, you don't want them coming back in. So you have an opportunity to fix problems. A lot of this has to do with you know drug and alcohol issues. Um, uh, anger management is a big problem, uh, and they address that. People are frustrated uh, and don't deal well with anger. So they designed their system to counter this problem of prisonization. We want to get rid of the pains of imprisonment. We realize we're depriving people of their liberty. That's the only thing we're going to do primarily, but we're going to uh, do the best we can to make that an open system. Uh, we're going we're gonna to put people into a high security situation, particularly violent offenders, but we're going to let them sort of, rather than having a parole system, we're going to work to lower and lower security arrangements as they progress through their program, right? So the as the person, you develop greater levels of trust. This is, um, you know, this is some, not, it's sort of analogous to the strikes or mark system that we see in some other systems, right? Where you start off with a certain number of demerits, if you will, and you have to work them off progressively towards release. Here, you get greater freedom. Uh, you work towards greater freedom. So again, it's uh, person-centered, as I've said, um, and most prisoners are assigned a contact officer who helps them not only with their rehabilitative program, but also mediating uh, uh, their interactions with others. So this is what's called normality, and I, I'm interested in your question, so I'll finish with this. This is what's known as normality, and the idea is that offenders have the same rights as others who reside in Norway. Um, Restrictions of liberty are the only punishment. Um, because isolation is a major concern, you have as much of a social life as possible. You're here, but you have access to the outside world. There are restrictions based on security concerns, and of course, resources are always a problem. Uh, but you tr you create a sense of trust. Uh, so you want the least restrictive circumstances uh, that are allowable in the system. And then one of the ways you do this, the mechanism is what's called an import model. This goes back to something I said earlier. They don't maintain in-house services for education, health care, et cetera. All of that is the same services that a person outside prison can access. So when you have uh, counseling sessions, you know, when you have when you are being educated, you are in the classroom with people who are not in prison. You're in counseling sessions with people who are not in prison. So the idea is this is the, this is where you're going to go. At, at It's where you stay at night. At certain security level, you'll be there all the time. But you'll have access to the same services, not just equivalent services, right? So what they're doing is this is they're not segregating the prisoner from those items that other citizens access. So this is the continuity of this. Uh, this is what every prisoner expects when they come in. They strive to make this uniform across the system, and they also bring the community into the rehabilitative process, and that's what we call restorative justice, right? How do we, how do we if we're going to reintegrate uh, the prisoner into society, into the community, we have to also bring the community in. And so people then know what the process is. It's not a mysterious black box in which people disappear and come back out. They know that this person, just like a person would be in you know, drug and alcohol treatment, the person gets out, they're accepted, and they're not stigmatized. And st stigmatization is one of the big factors that really plays. As we know, uh, although labeling theory is controversial, many aspects of labeling theory are true by definition. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's obvious uh, the effect that, that, that stigma has. Uh, if you want to, if you want a really good documentary on this, uh, I want to recommend that you see a, a. It's called Breaking the Cycle, and it compares uh, the Halden Prison in Norway, which is their mo sort of the model prison. It's a, it's, it's equivalent of a maximum security prison. I mean, there's you know violent offenders there, um, and they compare this to Attica, the correctional facility in uh, New York. 
And then they also talk about North Dakota. Uh, North Dakota was one of the earlier uh, penitentiary systems that took a delegation to Norway and, and wanted to apply their ideas. Now we've seen Hawaii, Alaska, and Wisconsin will be soon if I have anything to, to, to do about it. Uh, but um, there's there's a scene in there that's particularly powerful where the prisoners are asked to design a prison that they believe would help rehabilitate them. You know, what would be the ideal? This is an Attica. And they wind up with just a few differences describing the prison at Halden. Uh, and the guy says, the, the director there from Halden said, well, this is what we do. And it reminds me of Jeffrey Ryman and the Rich Get Richer and the Poor Get Prison, if you've read that book. But he asked his students to design a system which is guaranteed to fail. And they invariably come back with Attica. And and so as soon as I saw that, I thought, okay, so you can run the reverse experiment. You can say, what would be the, the you know, ask prisoners, what would be the ideal prison? Then ask people, you know, on the outside of prison, what would be the worst possible prison? And they wind up accurately describing the two contrasts that you see uh, in this Breaking the Cycle. So I highly recommend that documentary to get sort of more of a qualitative sense of the things that I'm talking about.